Well, good morning and welcome to the vagabond version of ALBW Live. Uh, I'm in between living places right now, so I'd, I'd really like to thank my dear friend, uh, Nick Taylor, for the use of her studio. My name is Pat Eskate. I'm the lead organizer of Ann Lister Birthday Week. And before we get started with our very fascinating guest, Patricia Hughes, I'd like to send out a few congratulations, if I might. First of all, I'd like to congratulate our dear friend, Rachel Lappin, who is, uh, will now be the new cultural manager for Halifax. Um, good, best of luck with that, Rachel, so happy for you. And I'd also like to thank Laura Johansson, who has been so helpful in her efforts in that job prior to Rachel. Uh, in helping us in Halifax with ALBW, and we wish her the best of luck. And finally, how could I how could I let this start without sending out a huge congratulation to Sally Wainwright on being named an OBE by the Queen? Um, can't think of anybody who deserves it more. So uh, thanks, Sally, and thanks for all you've done to bring Ann Lister into our lives. So on that note. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Patricia Hughes, our, our guest for today. And here she comes. Good morning, Patricia. Good afternoon in your time. Oh, good, good afternoon, yes. Yes, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm excellent, thanks. Um, uh, Patricia is the author of The Curious Tale of Young Ann Lister and Eliza Rain, and we're gonna be speaking about Eliza today. Uh, uh, Patricia and I had a chance to talk previously, as I always do with our guests, and she is just full of fascinating information on this less than stellar part of Ann Lister's life, but it's a very important part. Um, Patricia, I shared with you that I wanted to kind of do a quick rundown on the yes. beginnings of all this before we jump in. Um, the connection between Eliza Rain, Ann Lister, and Mr. Duffin, who uh, those of you who have been reading the diaries via uh, Helena Whitbread's work or uh, uh, Jill Liddington's work, may be interested to know that how, how Mr. Duffin got involved in Ann Lister's life. Well, there's a connection between him and Eliza Rain, uh, Mr. Duffin, as a young man, went to India as an assistant surgeon in the army. And it was there that he met Mr. Duffin, who was also a doctor. He, uh, they were both surgeons, they were both, both uh, surgeons for the East India Company. Exactly. Um, and they were, uh, the East India Company were conducting a huge war with uh, India. Yes. And so um, what happened was, um, uh, Mr. Rain, who was um, the better surgeon and more advanced than Mr. Duffin, um, he was taken prisoner of war. And um, during his prisoner of war years, he had a, uh, the, the boss of the camp was called the Kiladar. And the Kiladar's son became very, very ill. Yeah. And he's so ill that he had to appeal to the, the doctor in the camp to see if he could do anything because the other doctors could, the other uh, health professionals couldn't. And so um, Duffy and, sorry, William Rain actually cured him. And um, the Kiladar was so, um, so grateful that he let Mr. Rain set up his own surgery. And of course that was very important because it meant that he had contacts with the local, local villages and so on. So he could get money, transferred and transfer messages. Um, so that was not only for him, but for the whole camp. So he was very proud of what he did there. And yes. then afterwards he asked for compensation from the East India Company and they refused it. Oh. And because he sent them a complaint, um, they, they gave Duffin his job in Madras oh. rather than allowing Mr. Rain to get it. Right. Now, Duffin was his junior. <laughs> that, now, in the meantime, uh, Mr. Rain uh, had two, two children with an Indian woman, to which in, in terminology of those days, they were half-caste children. Uh, and uh, 
Mr. Rain, on his way back to England, he left his wife and daughters in India, but on his way back to England, he died on board a ship. Oh, well, in fact, he wasn't, if they weren't half caste, they were married. Uh, Rain was married to his Indian wife. Okay. I think she was Tamil uh, from Madras. Right. And um, so he was married to her by the local uh, customs, but they hadn't registered it with Britain. So ah. they weren't actually illegitimate in one country, but they were in the other. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And so he had named, uh, he had named Dr. Duffin, Mr. Duffin, uh, a, a guardian for the two girls should something happen to him, correct? Because uh, Mr. Duffin um, was very, very kind to Mr. Rain. He liked him very much. They lived next door to each other in Madras. Okay. Um, except that uh, Mr. Rain had a much bigger banana plantation. And um, so they would, uh, they would invite the, the Duffins, who didn't have any children of their own, to come and look at their new children, their new little uh, babies, and they would play with them. They knew them very well. They knew them like an uncle. Oh, um, so when Mr. Duffin retired, um, then he offered, uh, that was 18, um, 1897, uh, he offered 1797. Uh, that's right. He offered his job to to William Rain because he should have had it to begin with. So oh. Rain took his job very, very gratefully and held it for three years. Mm -hmm. But then he discovered he'd got something awful. We, I think, probably by the sound of it, it sounded like cancer or something oh. that he recognised and there was no cure for. Um, but he decided to make his will. And um, he must have told his wife about it and discussed it with her. And the children uh, knew that he was going to go back to England and that he might die. Mm. Um, and on the way, it was a six month journey from Madras to London um, by, by ship. And so on the way after three months, he died. And he was with his own servant called John Rain. Um, and um, John, helped with the, with the funeral. They buried him at sea. Mm -hmm. And when he arrived, John Rain went straight to Mr. Duffin as, as uh, um, expected and told Mr. Duffin what had happened. But because Mr. Duffin was his, his uh, executor, right. um, that, that was uh, very important. And Mr. Duffin had this um, uh, duty to go back and find the girls because the girls, were neither English nor Indian. Right. So if they'd stayed in India, they would have been killed. And it may be that their mother was killed. She had use of the farm, uh, but after the uh, girls uh, came back, she lasted just two years and oh. then nothing more was heard of her. Oh, how sad. So, yeah, that was very sad. So Mr. Duffin uh, made his six month journey back to India, brought, uh, gathered the two girls up and brought them back to England and uh, where they, they, they lived with Mr. Duffin, but he um, put them in a school for girls in Tottenham, is that correct? Or Tottenham? Tottenham, yes, yeah. as part of London. Um, I think there were a lot of girls coming in from different parts of the world mm -hmm. and uh, if they had a certain amount of money, they were expected to be able to mix with other English people. But English people at that point were very, very um, strict about their manners and etiquette right. and about the language and how to write and so on. And so girls had to be very carefully um, taken away from their free lives. Mm. For example, in uh, India, they were much freer than in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had to be made used to wearing all of the clothes and wearing the, uh, the, the makeup and the food, you know. And, well, they weren't wear, wearing the food, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so the, the two girls are now at school, but a, another important point that we should bring up is that uh, their father did not leave them destitute. In fact, they both had a, a lot of money from his estate. Um, somewhere in, in today's terms, they both inherited someplace between 600 and 700,000 pounds. Um, they had um, 
th uh, four thousand pounds each, mm -hmm. which they were allowed to have when they were twenty one, or when they got married if they got married before that. Right. Um, but if they got married, that money would would immediately go to their husbands, right? Because it wasn't held in trust for them; it right. was only for the husband, right? So, and this is a really important point, as we'll find out in a few minutes when we uh, come back to Eliza's sister, Jane, uh, yeah. who plays a, a really important role in this very sad story. Um, in the meantime, uh, you had a very interesting piece of information that you shared with me the other day, which takes place at this early point in Eliza's life, as well as Ann Lister's life. According to what you have recently found out, they didn't meet at the manor school. They met previously. Um, well, I can't verify this, but somebody told me this. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it sounds real. Um, they met in Scarborough. Um, and I was told that they met in Scarborough uh, with Aunt Anne there. So she would have gone to Scarborough to meet um, with Mr. Hunter. Yes. Uh, who was the York uh, Asylum um, uh, manager, mm -hmm. or she will have uh, gone there with, just as a, a holiday with Aunt Anne for the day. Right. Um, that was probably what happened. But Anne um, met Eliza there because Eliza was often in Scarborough and Jane as well, um, because their yeah. uncle lived there. Yeah. Right. And so they must have been accompanied by either Mr. Duffin or Miss Marsh or probably both of them. Right. And Miss Marsh, uh, because we haven't touched on that yet, Miss Marsh was the governess that Mr. Duffin hired for the two young girls. Yes. Uh, she later, much later, becomes uh, Mr. Duffin's second wife. But but so initially she had a flat opposite uh, a room at any rate opposite where mm -hmm. Mr. Duffin lived. Mm -hmm. So um, so that was 58 Nicklegate in York. Mm -hmm. um, so they became very, very close together because Mrs. Duffin at that point was very ill and stayed in bed all the time. So she was mostly looked after by a servant. And um, I think her husband was very genuinely in love with her, but you know, she'd become very ill yeah. and he was spending more time with the younger women now. So, you know, yeah. things happened. So, so in this period of time, uh, when, if we follow this thread that says that Anne and Eliza met previously in Scarborough, um, what you had said is that they uh, connected with each other immediately upon meeting, and it was decided that it might be good for the for both of them to attend the manor school in York. Uh, well, uh, I think Eliza and Jane were al already booked into the manor school. Okay. Um, again, that's got to be verified, but that's uh, that seems to be the point. Mm -hmm. And um, they wanted, therefore, Anne to come along because she got on so well with Eliza. And of course, it was very important for the families to stick together. They were friends anyway, but also for um, for the children. Right. Because um, I think Anne was a, a difficult child to manage. Yes, given, she, given her she time. She was very, to... very enthusiastic yeah. and yeah. very, very intelligent, but yes. unfortunately rather uncontrollable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. As we know that she was beaten regularly at Ripon from what she said in her in her diary. Well, Ripon was a normal girls school and she wasn't a normal girl. She didn't do what she was told. And um, she was always doing boyish things, um, climbing and um, jumping and dancing wildly and so on, which wasn't at all what a girl should do in those days. And I believe she wouldn't do any sewing. Oh, well, that did it right there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but so, so now this is, this is also very interesting because now we have Anne who, uh, as you have said, kind of tracked more towards what people thought boys would be doing. And, and then you have Eliza and here they are at the manor school and um, they start to communicate with each other through a code, but it was a code of Eliza's, correct? 
Um, the, yes, I think so. Um, they had um, a school day of approximately uh, 12 hours mm -hmm. from six in the morning till six at night. Um, on two days a week, they got afternoons off and they were allowed to either go to the church three times a day on Sundays or I'll see their relatives. So, um, you know, they were very, very um, quiet during lessons as well. And so therefore they could communicate by notes, but they couldn't speak to each other. So I think that's why they, they became so good at the notes. Right. Um, at, the, at the crypt anyway. And you said that um, from from your research, I think you told me that this code was something that Eliza and her sister Jane had been using. I believe so, yes. Um, I started having my doubts about whether it was Anne's because I couldn't find any reference to any kind of code before that, before Eliza. She, right. um, she did write uh, notes and things, but she didn't keep a diary before Eliza mm. and she, she didn't write notes. Right. So, uh, so that was uh, very important to, um, to note. And then the other point was that when she was learning languages, Anne only learned uh, dead languages to begin with. She mm. learned some French, but only to read, not to speak. Mm. And um, she learned the speaking later on, but not initially. And with the uh, dead languages, Latin and Greek, she definitely didn't learn to speak those. So therefore she couldn't speak and she wasn't all that good at um, general grammar, modern grammar. Right. So, uh, so therefore, you know, um, she wasn't good at organizing languages. And, you know, if you look at the um, code, it was the, the first code that they used it was actually very well organized. For example, all the vowels and numbers and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But so, it was linguistically organized. Right, so uh, I just want to mention one other thing before we come back to that. Um, when Patricia said that, uh, that Anne had not been keeping a diary before then, but Eliza had, uh, just for your general reference, when Eliza died, all of her records, including her diaries. Ah, uh, no, uh, you you think they were they went from Mr. Duffin to Anne, right? To Anne, um, correct? But no, they didn't. Anne had kept all of the letters and diaries um, right from the start. Eliza's diaries. Eliza's diaries, because they're not particularly long. Eliza's diaries right. It's only yeah. effectively two two small booklets. Right. Um, so, so therefore, she kept those, and and she kept all of the letters she ever received from anyone mm -hmm. in uh, very neat uh, rows and uh, in trays in, in proper order, date order. Right. So, so therefore, she ha she already had Eliza's letters, and she would sit and read them from time to time, and you know, say, well, she really did love me, yeah. and you know, s shed a few tears as well. Now she, um, so, so Eliza's diaries became part of Ann Lister's papers at the archives? Yes. So they are, they're, they're available for research there then um, going through the right channels. Um, well, they're, they're, they have a particular uh, designation. Um, okay. They are, you know, under the SH uh, double dot, double stroke, you know, and mm -hmm. then um, ML for modern, um, uh, modern literature and okay. they've got SH then and it's A at the end for Eliza, Eliza's um, things. Mm, so interesting. So um, as you, as a, na na at this point, uh, you, you are a linguist by trade, yes. but you had answered an ad uh, from Dorothy Thompson who was doing, uh, who was doing a transcription of Ann Lister's diaries. And for, uh, for our audience, this was happening at the same time that Helena Whitbread was doing her work, um, which does make a play later. But that's how you got involved in your research on Eliza, correct? Uh, no, I started it in 1984. I started transcribing the, the secret code. And then um, two years later in 1986, um, Eliza, um, 
sorry, Dorothy asked me to come and um, do it for her for two years as a research assistant, uh -huh. um, research associate. And um, so I came along and uh, unfortunately it was quite difficult to start with because she hadn't organized anything for me to work with. Right. I hadn't got a micro microfilm reader and I hadn't got a room or a table. Right. So I got my own machine and worked at home. Um, so most of the time we were communicating only on Wednesday afternoons. Right, right. So uh, we're going to do a little forward jump here on that subject because we want to make sure we get everything else in. Uh, uh, Helena Whitbread's work was published before Dorothy's. Yes. And um, which is partially why we all know that that work so much better. Uh, uh, Helena, as, as most of us know, really responded to Ann Lister from a heart place as opposed yeah. to a head place. And yeah. you, you said to me that you had the same feeling when you were, uh, when you were researching Eliza Rain, that she also touched your heart. Is that correct? Um, yes, she did. Because in the first place, Anne was always upset about Eliza. Mm -hmm. She was always, um, you know, really in tears and really had to be asked to go and see Eliza to begin with. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a lot of tension. Um, and I needed to know what, what had caused Anne to, to be like that. She, she wasn't like that to anybody else, mm. lover or not, you know, mm -hmm. her, her, the, her life was completely rational mm -hmm. apart from Eliza. Mm. And um, so then I started to read a little bit more and to put together the notes that I had on Eliza because she only went to see her about maybe once a month to start with um, and much less afterwards. Right. Um, this is because because uh, we skipped this a little bit, Patricia. What Patricia is referring to is after Eliza Rain winds up in the asylum. That's later exactly on right. in life. This is not we're not back in her childhood days at this point or no. younger. Right. Um, Eliza had some kind of illness around about 1810 or 11, uh, which took a long time to, um, to uh, be gone. Mm -hmm. And during that time, she became um, very thin and weak and lost her hair. Mm -hmm. So, um, so she, she didn't seem to recover from that very well for a long time. But I think she was really not so much ill physically as... Um, ill mentally because she was finding all kinds of problems. First of all, Anne was, um, because they had had this, um, uh, this affair that they had right. discovered. Yes, the affair that they started in school in 1804, right. uh, because they were both sharing um, uh, a room in the attic. At the slope, correct. And That's what? right. Let's stay on that right now, Patricia, and then we'll move forward into, into the later days with them okay. because there's a lot to talk about inside of this whole affair that they were having. Um, I do want to go back to the one thing that you said about the first code. You believe there was more than one code, correct? I know there was, yes. I got them here. You have to excuse the stains, but I've got the one. One is the Greek code where she's used the Greek language to mm. uh, the Greek alphabet to use to uh, give the French the English alphabet, but she hasn't put them all in the right places. They're mixed up. So okay. therefore you have to know what you're looking for. Right. Um, and the second one is the consonant code where she's just used the consonants from mm. the language. Do you know what I mean by consonants? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, yes. so, so yes. she just used the consonants, but she's put little dots and, and bars where you don't expect them. And now, each, each one, each dot or bar across means a different uh, letter. Are you, when you say she, are you referring to Eliza or to Anne? No, these are made by Anne because they're not very good codes in comparison. Got it. Aha, there you go. <laughs> not, not easy to learn. <laughs> right. So eventually... Uh, eventually the cryptan, the code, becomes part of Ann Lister's life. Um, she's much more facile at, at using it at that point. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, 
so Anne and, and uh, Eliza are at school together. They're having an affair, uh, mm -hmm. but they get caught. And they um, get caught because they're passing a parcel to one another, correct? Yes, that's right. They're passing parcels all the time because it, um, it's part of the school thing as well with the notes where they can't speak for a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the parcels that they're passing um, from um, Anne, they tend to be things like um, essays and, uh, you know, things that they have to write and poetry and all sorts of things. But from Eliza, they tend to be um, solid things like jewels or mm -hmm. money. Oh, wow. Yeah, because Eliza has got into the habit by now, by being at school, of giving, uh, of giving Anne a certain amount of money every time she needs it. Uh-huh, right. And so that may be uh, what's in the parcel. We don't know what's in the parcel, mm. but the parcel was passed from Anne or from Eliza to another person who was supposed to deliver it to the other person. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't delivered to the other person. It went straight to the headmistress. So right. the headmistress did what headmistresses do. She called um, the lady who was paying for Anne who was her aunt, Aunt Anne. Right. Um, her Aunt Anne came in and was told that um, the girls had been discovered to be doing things they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed either of them to board any longer um, in, because they'd both been boarding in the same school. Right. Um, and um, Eliza was allowed to carry on being at the school as a day boarder. Right. Um, but unfortunately, Anne wasn't. However, Anne was very bright and she was asked if she could come back uh, later. Right, um, after, after Eliza graduated. After Eliza had gone and done her bits, yes. Right, now, and Eliza, also an important point, um, Eliza is now a day boarder, but she's living with the Duffins. That's right. Right, um, which is, again, I want to I want to underscore this relationship between Eliza and the Duffins, which is um, very close. Uh, if it weren't for Eliza Rain, it's entirely possible that uh, if we if we follow the track that Anne wound up at the Manor School from having met Eliza Rain, uh, it's very possible that that Anne Lister may never have met. Uh, Tib Norcliffe or Mariana Belcom. Um, and one of the ways that happens is because when Anne is allowed to go back to the manor school, she's living at the Duffins in Eliza's old room, correct? Yes, but that room, the spare room at the Duffins, has had many, many people in it. I mean, the, Jane was in it before mm. Eliza uh, had to, while Eliza was a boarder. Her sister Jane was there. Jane was two years older. Mm -hmm. And because of that, when um, Eliza had to come as a day pupil when she was 13, mm -hmm. uh, Jane was leaving school at 15. And Jane was going off to live with her, their cousin, Lady Crawford in Doncaster. Right. And um, some, somewhere along the line there, and again, I'm sort of tightening this up a little bit because there's so much more to talk about in our short period of time. Somewhere along the line, Jane meets a military man and she marries him. Well, Jane um, goes to live with, um, with Lady Crawford, their cousin, mm -hmm. uh, who is 35 years older and mm. has never been abroad. And therefore she does not take kindly to having an Indian girl, a girl who looks Indian. Mm. And uh, she really wants to marry them off, the girls, mm. as fast as possible. Um, but Jane resists that, obviously. Um, and she doesn't like being told what she can do at any time and uh, where she can go. So therefore, she goes straight back to Mr. Duffin's. Mm -hmm. uh, but at Mr. Duffin's, she doesn't feel welcome there. She feels that she's encroaching. Um, and so she starts to go and visit her uncle in Scarborough more often because he's a working man and with a family, so he doesn't mind them coming over. Um, so on the way there and back halfway, the coach has to change horses because uh, it's a 20 mile um, uh, uh, journey. 
-hmm. So when the when the coach changes horses at Moulton, she meets um, uh, Henry Bolton, right. and he's an ensign. He's a um, uh, he's uh, a in the army. I'm not quite sure what he's uh, what he's uh, is to begin with, right. but he becomes an ensign after he marries Jane. Right. An ensign is somebody who's paid for the um, for for the promotion. Right. And to underscore this again, um, when when Jane marries uh, Henry Bolton, her money goes to him. Yes, she's very very uh, impressed with Henry Bolton because he's working in Calcutta. He's back on leave from Calcutta, right. and she really wants to return to India because she has wonderful memories. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, he marries her against Duffin's advice. Mm -hmm. uh, she she goes right against his advice, Jane, and, and says, but I love him. And uh, they go off to Calcutta. And there, once he's got her money, he abandons her. Right. And, and, we, and we'll pick up on, on Jane again in a little bit. But keep in mind now that Eliza's sister Jane is now in India destitute. Yes. So we're going to come back to Eliza and Anne now. So uh, Anne is back at the manor school and Eliza goes to Halifax. And, and Eliza becomes close with the Lister family. Yes. Um, she, she has been going for uh, holidays there over the past two years. Yes. Um, and they've been used to having her every summer. And the fact that she's been um, uh, told, well, the girls have been told to separate at school or not, are not allowed to touch, to meet or anything. Um, nevertheless, um, her mother, Rebecca Lister, um, Anne's mother, um, allows them to come home and during the summer holiday to sleep together as they always have done in the same bed which is quite normal in those days for uh, people of the same sex. Oh. And so therefore, you know, they, they are quite happy. They spend two or three months um, together and um, go, go around looking at Jade's friend, at um, Anne's friends and so on. Um, so they're all very happy. And then Eli Eliza goes back on the 11th of August in 1806 and that's when Anne's diaries begin. That, they start on just a scrap of paper, um, but the point is that the reason for the diary becomes immediately, um, uh, immediately obvious because she, all that she is doing is writing down what she has sent to Eliza and what she has received from Eliza because right. they're checking whether it is going the right, um, uh, uh, the right route with right. the right person right. and whether they have been, um, you know, betrayed again. Yes, so, yes. so therefore, uh, that is how the diaries start. And then gradually, um, over the months and years, she starts to add a little bit more and a little bit more. Right. And then in 1817, she actually starts to buy the quarto diary books. Right, right. One per year. Right, it's become, <clears throat> it's become her regular, um, her regular habit yes to be writing in that diary and 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 we all know the outcome of that yes um so so anne is is back at the york school she is now meeting a whole new group of people and these people are connected to the duffins as well uh they're all doctors correct mr duffin mr um, they, they are all doctors but they're not necessarily connected Mm. The, um, the two that she meets at the Manor School, first of all, she meets um, Isabella Norcliffe, Tib, right. and um, she um, is quite amazed by Tib because Tib is another lesbian mm -hmm. and very masculine lesbian like, like herself. Um, but they don't really get on. They do try, try uh, you know, whether they will get on, but they don't. Um, but they are friends, nevertheless. And um, Tib knows, um, Tib is a day pupil, of course, um, but um, Tib knows Marianne Belkin very well because they live on opposite sides of the street. Um, and, and so, you know, that's important. Um, 
for uh, Mariana, that's her father's um, uh, surgery, if you call, if you can call it that. It's yeah. where he works because he works as um, effectively a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. a sort of mental doctor anyway for uh, the mind rather than the body. Right. Right. But I think he's perfectly well qualified as a proper doctor first, as a physical doctor first. Right. Um, but he concentrates on the mental. Um, right. And he is very much against the, um, the current way of looking after mental people, me mental patients, because um, he, uh, he thinks that they need to be treated with kindness. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Anyway, right across the street lives the Norcliffs. That's their townhouse, but their actual uh, residence is a few miles away in Langton, Langton mm -hmm. Hall, which mm -hmm. is a huge, a huge mansion and uh, has its own village attached. Um, and, you know, it, it, um, it owns all of the properties around it. Right. And um, Isabella Norcliffe's um, mother, is the local magistrate um, and she has a great deal of money as well um, so when her husband marries her he takes on her name of Norcliffe hmm. rather than the other way around interesting so so Anne has now fallen in with a with a group of friends uh, who both have money of their own, she is still kind of inching up the ladder of her own, uh, uh, where she stands in the Lister um, uh, fortune. Well, 1813, she, first of all, she was a, uh, a girl, so girls didn't normally right. um, inherit if there were boys in the family. Right. And um, uh, she, she was therefore not expecting any money and she didn't have any money while she was with Eliza. Right. Um, but then she um, she finds out that uh, her brother is very ill. There's a kind of flu going around, a kind of, um, you know, intense Spanish flu type of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, her brother dies of pneumonia, her brother John, mm -hmm. whom she used to get on with very, very well. Uh, but that's in 1813. And um, after that, uh, two years later, um, I think that's 18, it's like, I've got the dates wrong, it's, I think that's 1811. Mm. Uh, but after that, um, two years later, 1813, um, the, uh, the other one, Sam, mm. is, he, he's the only heir, so he's um, asked to toughen up a bit and go and join the army. Mm. And he does so, and he drowns in the process. Right. And you, you describe Sam as a, a, a sensitive boy. Yes. Uh, not tough. And that's one of the reasons that they put him in the service. That's right. Yeah. And there's been kind of, depending on who you're reading, there's different discussions that have gone on back and forth about whether um, uh, Eliza was very close with, uh, with Sam. Um, I believe she was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but there was also another adopted son of Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Yes. Mrs. Stubbs. Well, when when uh, eighteen oh six came and um, the two girls were asked to separate at school, um, and Eliza came back to stay with um, uh, the Lister family. Right. Um, Mrs. Lister, Rebecca Lister. Uh, she brought um, her her adopted son from Northern Ireland. Her father, her her husband had been uh, stationed in Northern Ireland mm. for for several years after he'd finished working in America. Right. Um, but um, uh, he came back to and was uh, sent to Northern Ireland as captain. Right. Um, and um, uh, while he was over there, his mother, um, uh, rather his wife, Anne's mother adopted a, a, a local boy and uh, he didn't live with them he lived in Northern Ireland but nevertheless she felt a duty towards him to um, marry him as, as soon as possible to uh, a decent lady so he th she thought also that because the two girls had obviously been um, in an affair at school mm -hmm. and were perfectly happy together 
and we're not causing any problems other than you know from the school's point of view that they should be allowed to stay together because mr stubbs wasn't particularly bright mm -hmm. and he had no money and therefore any money that would come into the family would be eliza's so so, so, so getting eliza to marry mr stubbs was a really good way to bring her fortune into the lister family but she yes like and that. to keep the two girls together as well yeah yeah. So, so that was uh, Mrs. Lister's quite um, ingenious way of trying to, you know, uh, join the family to keep the family together. Right. Um, now, she well, didn't work though. Right. Yeah. Um, so again, in the interest of time, so Eliza has been uh, coming to Halifax to visit during holiday. And she, in fact, actually, while, while Anne is going to school in York and, and uh, hanging out with Mariana and Tib and the rest, Eliza actually buys a house in Halifax and fixes it up beautifully and is waiting for Anne to come home, correct? Um, well, she does. She gets a beautiful house and she spends a lot of time and effort getting the right furnishings and the right uh, colors on the walls and the right lamps and so on, and cushions. Um, so she has loads and loads of, um, of things and she makes it a very, very nice place. She right. really does. And she likes it herself. Mm -hmm. She's very, very keen on staying there. She doesn't feel that she needs to stay with the Lister family right. because they're both growing up and she thinks, well, I will make a house for Anne to come back to when she's finished school. Right. Now there's there's some incidents that happen along the way. And again, we are we're jumping a little bit here, but what, Eliza's in Halifax. She has her own home and there is a young army captain that uh, Oh, that comes much later. Okay. Um, um but um first of all, um what happens in Halifax um is that uh Eliza realizes that she's being hated by the locals and the reason they're hating for uh, hating her is not simply because she looks indian not simply because she has a fortune but right. everything about her in that sense because all of the people locally are suffering from banks going um bankrupt right the banks are locking themselves up and refusing to give out money. Mm. People are going bankrupt. There's no law of liability at this point. Mm -hmm. So there are no limited companies. Everything is up for grabs if uh, your, your, uh, your company needs it. Right. So, so therefore, a lot of people are suddenly being thrown out of their houses, suddenly having to lose even their clothes. Right. Um, because clothes are quite expensive in those times. Right. And if, if they are sent to the debtor's prison, they don't want to go with uh, very good clothing because that point that marks them out. So now here's Eliza who has this lovely house and has money and um, is yes. dark skinned. Yes. And, and so there is, and the reason that I'm, that I'm pressing on this point is, is there's a reason why Eliza Rain winds up in an asylum eventually, yes. and 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 there's a, a road that starts to happen here. She's at this point, the people in Halifax are starting to turn against her, and she yes. understands that it has people, to be. people that she liked and knew very well are yes. starting to make nasty comments to her. Right, and meanwhile, back over in in York, mm -hmm. Anne is having sort of the opposite thing happened with her that she's getting uh, closer and closer with this group of people, uh, Mariana Tibb, etc. And while while Eliza is struggling a little bit with being um, cast away from people, Anne is finding herself part of a group and Mrs. Norcliffe suggests that they all go to Bath. Right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. And Eliza is hoping to be invited. In, Eliza expects to be invited, right? Um, because she and Anne are still technically um, at the same point they were yes. uh, when she left school. That is to say, um, Eliza is still expecting Anne to come back and is still expecting to be part of her life. 
And he's so still during, giving her money. Yes, and during the holidays, yes, she's still giving her money. Yeah. And during the holidays, she um, she expects that Anne will think of her as a partner all the time. Right. And then Anne doesn't. And Anne has found that in the first place, her um, her girlfriends, Anne and um, Tib, do not get on quite so well with uh, with Eliza. Right. Because they tend to treat her a bit like a sort of servant. Yes. And yeah. um, and she's also finding that Mrs. Norcliffe, who is funding this trip, really doesn't want to bring um, uh, uh, Eliza as well. Right. So Eliza, and again... It's never it's said. Just, it's never said. Yeah. It's just but, implied. Yes. So we are running, uh, we're going to be running a little long, but there's still a lot to cover here. Um, Eliza uh, takes a house in Clifton outside of Bath and- uh, She takes the room. She takes the room. room there, yes. And she hopes that, uh, she's still hoping she's gonna get an invite over there, but she's hoping that people will come and visit. There's no, one- There's one, yeah. And then you said that somebody did, but they told her it was- Mrs. Priestley came. She was a lady from Halifax, yeah. and Mrs. Priestley said that she she regarded it as a charity that she would come and see her. Yeah. So here's and, here's Eliza. She's been ignored by the woman who she still believes that she, she still considers herself married to. They've yes. exchanged rings. Um, Anne is now found greener pastures because she's now in, involved in a torrid affair with Marianna Belcom. Uh, but she, Anne, Anne believes um, that now that she's second in, uh, in line for the uh, airship, mm -hmm. she believes um, what is the common thing to believe then, that it is wrong to, uh, uh, to be too close to natives. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, that's the word that people use in England, natives. Right. It meant the people who were born in the places that you were colonizing. Right. Um, but, um, but natives always have dark skin as well. Right. Right. And so, um, so she was um, being pushed aside for that reason. Right. So, and now, uh, and this may not be in exactly the right time frame, but in, in the interest of time, um, Jane reappears. Jane comes back to England. Uh, she gets a, lot, a hard time. First of all, she has to come on the six month journey on the boat, right. uh, uh, which is a huge liner. Um, and um, uh, she's alone for the first time in her life. Right. And therefore, you know, something happens, don't know what. But when she gets as far as France, she is stopped. And um, they say she, she's not English. She doesn't look English. Right. And so they put her in jail until she can prove that she is. Right. And it takes, her, yeah, it takes her six months to do that um, until she, she gets some legal representation and they can see that she is English. And then she comes out of jail and she's pregnant. Right. So and she she's obviously not pregnant with her, her husband. Right. And so therefore that is a criminal offense at that point. So she shows up, she shows up at Eliza's doorstep. She's no, she she no, she's she goes to Mr. Duffin. Mr. Duffin, right. She, yeah. she she's pregnant. She's um she's been she's destitute. Because her husband, meanwhile, who's still back in India, has all her money. Yes. And again, in the custom of the time, Mr. Duffin tells her that there's little he can do for her because she has left his guardianship when she got married. That's right. And she's fairly pretty and much. She, she has used up all of her money as well. She yes. has nothing to pay. Right. And so, so he basically turns her away and yeah. both Mr. Duffin and Ann Lister tell Eliza that they that she should not take up after Jane that she should let Jane go off and do because Jane has committed these grievous sins well that's right Jane Jane is a criminal with a pregnancy 
and Jane has also um, lost her money and lost her status in society. So it is normal in those days to cut people yeah. to to simply say you don't exist as far as I'm concerned because you're a different class. Right. So for example, you would cut servants in the street because right. they're a different class, right. and um, you know, and they would cut you because they can't uh, they can't approach you, and so she has to cut her sister. Um, right. That's so, very. It, it's it, very depressing for her as well. Right, and so so it's depressing for Eliza. There's something else that's happened with Eliza in this period of time, and that is this Captain Alexander. Who has... uh, Captain, ha Ca Captain Alexander comes later because, okay. um, yes, he, he starts to meet um, uh, Eliza and they've known each other for several years mm -hmm. because the Alexander family were regularly visited by Anne and Eliza from 1806 onwards. Right. Um, but um, they, they start to meet with John, who's now a captain, mm -hmm. and... Um, they um she starts to meet with john who's now a captain and the meetings become later and later and a little bit more romantic here and there in those days that simply was not done right you know i mean the, the kids now can do what they like but in those days it was not done because it meant breach of contract right if, uh, somebody made as if they wanted to marry somebody else and didn't that that they could be sued for breach of contract? So so uh, short story. Uh, Captain Alexander does uh, ask Eliza to marry him, but again, in comes Mr. Duffin and Ann Lister, who says, "No, you shouldn't well, do this." They say, "Well, look at what happened to Jane." Right. So once again, Eliza now sends the captain away, but there's, a, there's an outcome from that in Halifax because of, what, because of the fact that they were meeting later and later. And because she has now cut the captain out of her life, Halifax cuts her. That's right. So now you've got Eliza, again, now you see Eliza continuing down on this downward spiral of being cut away from other people, of having it made clear to her that it's the color of her skin. Uh, that, that is something that it takes um, a long time for her to understand because as a colored child, she was very welcome. Right. And it's, um, it's still very, very apparent that she uh, gets the look from gentlemen as they pass her. Right. You know? um, so, you know that is that is uh, making her feel that some people want her around and some people don't yes. you know she's very confused yes. about, about who she can be and who she can't so the in the next steps of what happens to the two rain sisters um uh, jane becomes ill and uh it's decided that she should be admitted to an asylum someplace. Well, but, but Mrs. Marsh or Miss Marsh, the governess says, well, it's really Eliza who should be in an asylum, correct? Um, well, what happens is that um, Eliza is very, very upset, very um, down about everything. Yeah. And one, one day um, in Blake Street, she's now moved to Blake Street in York, mm -hmm. uh, where she has a room and her servants moved there too. Um, and um, her, one day her servant goes downstairs to answer the door, where the, which is being knocked. And um, she opens the door and finds Jane there. Mm -hmm. And of course, Eliza says, tell her to go away. Um, but um, the servant says, well, you know, she's in such a state, she needs to come in. And so they bring Jane in and she is destitute. Yeah. She's been living as a prostitute since she gave birth to her son. Yeah. And her son was given away straight away because he was illegitimate. She has had no contact at all with her in-laws who are the only people she can contact. Right. But they don't want to know her because she was a criminal and had somebody else's son. 
And um, so, you know, she can't look after herself at all. She has no money and no income. And so she's become a prostitute mm -hmm. and um, she's ragged and she's living in a place where she can't have a bath. And, um, you know, her son has died when he was six. He died probably of malnutrition. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a hard life. Right. And so she comes in and um, uh, Eliza takes her in and um, gives her food and dresses her and baths her. And, uh, you know, they really are very kind to her. Yeah. And they say, uh, Eliza says, well, you know, you need somewhere stable to live. Right. And the only thing that we can afford is, you know, a home somewhere. Is that okay? Um, because she's heard about these homes, mental homes, which are very nice. And there are mental homes which are very nice at that stage, um, uh, mainly using uh, what's called the Dutch system. Um, but in any case, she um, sort of goes about it because she, she has by now fallen out with everybody in York and in Halifax. Right. So she's not interested in Mr. Duffin, right. although he knows her very well. She's not interested in the Balcoms. She's not interested in Dr. Uh, Dr. Best, who is uh, the Balcoms' um, uh, brother-in-law, because uh, although he's now running the asylum, York Asylum, he's just um, had to go to Italy because he's been sacked, because he's been unfortunately badly run right pe his people have been uh, accusing him of putting people in chains in cellars of straw and not feeding them right so so so, uh, so, so we have this situation now where eliza who has been going through her own um uh her her own being cut off from the rest of society grows angrier and angrier and this is what uh, now Jane has been moved into uh, an asylum for a period of time, but now there's this growing movement that Eliza should be in an asylum. Um, Jane, Jane never gets to an asylum okay. um, right. because because uh, the um, the the rumor goes round that she is having Jane committed to an asylum, which is not. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, and uh, Miss Marsh becomes really angry about this and says that it's Eliza who's mad and not Jane. And um, so Jane never gets to an asylum. She goes off with the man. Um, but, um, but Eliza, meanwhile, is really at the end of her tether mentally. Right. She just can't cope with it, with all of this stuff. And so she starts to shout at people and scream and, you know, and throw things and so on. And she's seen as definitely being mentally disturbed now because right. life skills don't do that. Right. And so she she winds up, um, and, and I do urge all of you to read Patricia's very fine book because there's far more detail on this. Um, Eliza winds up going, actually going in and out of an asylum for a short period of time. They let her out for a period. She goes back in for a period, etc. And but she goes into Dr. Belcom's asylum. Yes, Dr. Belcom's asylum. Yes. So in this interim period, and we're closing in now on this, the sad end of this story, um, Eliza is now in an asylum. Jane, meanwhile, has died of tuberculosis. She, she was um, very unfortunate, Jane, because um, she was already suffering from tuberculosis right. and quite ill yes. um, when she heard that um, her, her husband had been killed in, India. Uh, in action. He yes. bought an ensign ship with his... Um, uh, with his um, uh, with her money, yeah. and he'd become um, a captain and had led the troops. Um, yeah, but yeah. unfortunately, he died in the battle. And um, so therefore, all of his money came back to his wife since they had no children. And, and because they had been legally married. Yes. So, it was, so Jane, now ha Jane now has a pot of money that is again it's um, about 
3,000 pounds. That's right. He'd spent a thousand of it, which which winds up someplace around a half a million, but a half a million pounds in today's money. But yeah. of course, she's one step from death's door, and she never gets to use it or do anything with it. And it winds up going to Eliza on top of Eliza's own um, small fortune. Uh, because um, when when Jane dies, um, the, what they say is that she was 30, but she looked 60. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the poor girl had suffered all through her adult life. Right. In fact, from when she was about 10 onwards, her life had been awful. Right. Um, so... But Eliza, Eliza was lucky in that she didn't suffer, but she suffered mentally. Yes, she suffered mentally. She wound up in the asylum, um, as we know, and as we talked about originally, uh, Ann Lister does come to visit only because she's forced uh, in the first place. Yes, yeah, and she's still getting money from Eliza at this point. Yeah, she's still getting money from Eliza. Yes, but, but Mr. Duffin and Miss Marsh actually do start to listen to Eliza and they realize that she is sending Anne money and that she is still, in her mind, married to Anne. They now understand what the, what the source of her anger is. And they understand how much she's been betrayed. Yeah, yeah. And they understand also that Anne has a lot of things that belong to Eliza. Yes. Like Eliza's favorite um, painting and um, uh, gloves yeah. and... Um, and very beautiful um, trinkets of various kinds, real jewelry, yeah. and um, you know all sorts of things. And and uh, Eliza's bought her a gold wedding ring, which she doesn't wear any longer. Yeah. You know all sorts of things that um, Eliza has given Anne. So they begin to realize that there's more to this than uh, they believed. That met the eye. So. So to wrap this up, because we have people that are actively asking questions at this point, um, Eliza winds up spending her life, the rest of her life, not just in the asylum. When the asylum closes and it turns into a boys' school, she's moved into a house where she lives with two caretakers. That's, but, um, that's when she's 50. Right. Yes, when, when Dr. Henry Belcom has died and his son, Dr. Stephen Belcom, takes over. And right. then when Dr. Stephen Belcom retires, then it's turned into a boys' school. So you can see she was there for, for over 40 years. Right. And as we all know, unfortunately, Ann Lister died on her trip to Russia. But um, the bottom line here is that Eliza Rain, at the age of 68, dies of a stomach problem yes and leaves behind a uh, pot of money that's about uh, eight thousand pounds at that time close to a million pounds uh, a million pounds now but she has no heirs so where does it it's go? around nine thousand pounds because none of it has been used it's yeah. it's had a lot of interest yeah um, and, and she has pardon where does that money go when she dies? Oh, well, it goes to the crown. Um, the um, Miss Marsh is very, very anxious for Anne to get it mm. um, because Miss Marsh is saying, well, you were married to her in theory. Mm. And um, so, you know, uh, one does get a bit of um, uh, a little bit nervous about that because, you know, she wasn't married in any other sense. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, in fact, the... Um, the the crown sees that as very important and uh, they take the money so mm -hmm. you know it all goes to the crown it all goes to the state so bye 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 jane and eliza rain so you patricia as uh, uh, the teller of eliza rain's tale to close our little portion before we go to q a you had a really interesting experience uh, in terms of how you bumped into Eliza Rain in a manner of speaking. So well, I, I just kept coming across references to her where Anne Lister had gone to see her and cried. And uh, Anne Lister had been reading her letters and, you know, kind of said, well, she was unlike anybody else. And this sort of thing kept coming 
And then I started to look up Eliza in the records mm -hmm. and uh, found that she was Indian. I could not believe that. And then I started to work out how she had come to be over in England at that point and yes. all sorts of things and whether she had relatives. I mean, there were marvels to be heard. The only thing I didn't find out about Eliza was who her mother was. Right. But then you found you found Eliza's headstone in kind of an odd little way, didn't you? Yes. You um, well. Go on, you, you, you said that you had uh, you you were in the cemetery and you sat down to eat your sandwich. <laughs> oh yes, that's true. I'd gone to um, Halifax for the week, and um, it was a beautiful summer's day. And I'd been um, everywhere else. It was sun Sunday, and I was coming coming back um, on the Monday. So on the Sunday, I everything was closed. So I went across to um, Osbaldwick. Mm -hmm. to see if I could identify the house uh, where she lived, mm -hmm. the old terrace house. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, I couldn't. I couldn't tell which house it was. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I got my sandwiches in my bag and it was very warm. So I walked into the uh, graveyard of the church. The church was right in the middle, uh, like an island in the middle of the village. So um, I walked into the churchyard and I thought I might take a few photographs in a minute. And um, while I was eating, I was halfway through, I'd eaten one sandwich and I got another one to go. And I looked across from where I was sitting and there was Eliza Rain's gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> I could not have arranged it in any other way. It was beautiful. <laughs> so I, I had to put my sandwiches down and take a photograph first yeah, before yeah. I could carry on. <laughs> Oh, it was lovely. I walked around it twice and um, looked at um, the the um, beautiful colour and the and the state of it. It was it was as if it had been put there yesterday. Isn't that? And something? it had a little foot foot plate at the bottom, foot stone. Uh, it was really nice. It's I, I it's nice that I love that little part of the story. So now we have questions from the audience, and uh, as you know. They come in on my text. So we're going to start this, well, from Jen, Jen Carter. And Patricia, what you need to know is Jen Carter is someone who, who I have certainly run into many times at ALBW, and she's sort of an inspiration to me. Um, Jen Carter is Indian. Oh, that's nice. Yes. And she wants to ask, and she's recently come out to her family in India, which is just something that continues to astound me. And Jen, once again, brava to you, sister. Um, Jen wants to know, why would Eliza and Jane be at risk of being killed if they had stayed in India? Um, because they were um, neither English nor Indian. They were half and half. So their mother was Indian and she would have been seen as somebody really criminal by the Indian people because she had betrayed her race and gone to live with uh, a man of the invaders, the colonizers. Mm. And um, so she, um, the reason I think she vanished is because she was probably killed two years later. Wow. I don't know that, but, but I really uh, do believe that. And that was why the two girls had to get out of India fast. Right. Um, wow. But they came to England and found that they were just as unwanted here, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, some things never change, but let's hope that we are on the cusp of making that happen now. Yes, I hope so. Too long. Um, OK, this question is from Jude Dobson. What was the year long journey Mr. Duffin took to collect Eliza and Jane like? Is this recorded anywhere like the East India Company ship logs? Um, I did have the name of the ship, but I, I can't remember it offhand. But yes, it was um, a regular trip. Madras was at that point the center of the uh, British uh, Empire mm. in India. Mm -hmm. They later made it Calcutta, but at that time it was Madras. And from Madras to London, there were constantly boats um, going to and from, bringing uh, things from India. Mm. Because it was one of the things that the British did very well, scouring the countries that they went into for anything that they could use. Yeah, and you bet. So yeah. 
uh, yeah, India was very important and the China and uh, the uh, Silk Road to China as well, which right. uh, was quite nearby in those terms, um, because they could um, bring back spices, materials, um, mm. anything, yes, yeah. and, and also slaves. Uh, this question is from um, uh, Beth Donald. Did Anne use Eliza's code as is, or did she adjust it at all? Uh, she adjusted it. Um, mainly, they used it as is to begin with, but they will have found uh, certain names, like teachers' names, um, uh, e quite easy to uh, to put into shorthand. Mm -hmm. And um, when, later on, Anne's uh, Anne's um, uh, version of it um, had lots of names of people like Charles Lawton that Eliza never knew. Um, so uh, Charles Lawton was Mariana Balcom's husband. Right, right. So, so all these names would go into it. By the way, and I meant to, uh, I think I skipped over this, but um, Mariana, it was Anne that asked Mariana to visit Eliza in the first place. Is that right? She yes. said, so Mariana visits Eliza and she's the one that turns to her father about admitting Eliza into Dr. Belcombe's asylum. Mariana, uh, right? Yes, because Mariana knew more about mental problems because that was what the family did. Right. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Belcombe was very involved in helping Dr. Belcombe with all of his um, work right. and as well as being his secretary effectively she right. was also um a, a nurse or a mental nurse so right. so therefore mariana knew about what to look for right. and that was why she was involved i think wow and, and also because her because her father had the mental asylum as well i wonder how much mariana knew about uh anne and eliza rain do we know anything about that um well um and asked um, Isabella Tibb to, um, to meet with um, Eliza Rain. Right. And uh, Eliza gave a very, very descriptive um, article about it or letter about it to Anne um, and said that, um, you know, effectively Isabella was treating her like an object mm. and was kind of looking her up and down and saying, you know, do you sleep with Anne then, this sort of thing. Wow. And um, she, she didn't like being attacked in that sort of a way. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know why, but I think maybe I felt that, that Anne and Isabella were trying to build up a threesome. Oh, interesting. Yeah. A threesome well, with, with uh, um, yeah. uh, an Indian girl. Yes. Yeah. Well, wow. Mm. Well, mm. yeah. Uh, this is from Ronnie Ray Staples. Did Anne continue to visit Eliza at the asylum after her union with Anne Walker? Yes. Uh, well, no, she didn't because um, I, I think she probably did. Um, the thing is that um, Anne died in 1840 right. and um, Eliza died in 1860. Right. So there were 20 years at the end. But um, Anne was going um, along with Anne Walker in right. the last um, five years of her life, mainly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so she probably was visiting Eliza occasionally. They did things differently, um, uh, I mean, separately in those days, but both of the Annes, right. uh, because Anne uh, Walker, for example, was very involved in the schools and things that she ran. Mm -hmm. um, and um, meanwhile, Anne, Anne Lister was more involved in her own estates. So, uh, so they were occasionally apart, even though they lived together. There's one last question here. And uh, <clears throat> this is, <clears throat> excuse me, once again from Jen Carter. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, you have Krishna and Radha on your book cover. What was the inspiration behind the choice of that cover? I like it very much. I've uh, learned about Krishna and Radha mm. through the children I was teaching at school. Mm. Um, I was mostly in mixed, uh, uh, mixed areas. 
Mm. And I liked hearing the different stories. And the Indian gods were beautiful and I, I really liked them very much. Mm. I had uh, lots of uh, students called Krishna as well. Mm. So I used a nice name too. It's <laughs> very nice. Well, Patricia, I, I want to thank you for um, for joining us today. Uh, I, I, I've, I've always found your, your work so interesting and, and I'm glad to uh, have given you a platform today to talk about it. Um, uh, Patricia will be with us at ALBW when that happens in 2021. Yes. We're yeah. looking forward to it whenever it comes. Yes, whenever it comes. And uh, I urge all of you that are going to be joining us um, at uh, ALBW to come see Patricia because you'll have a chance to ask her much more detailed questions as we yes. kind of raced through a really interesting story. But Patricia, thank you so much. We're going to let you go now. Um, I'll still be here for a few minutes. We have a couple of announcements, but thank you so much for your time. It's, um, been, very, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Okay, and you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so the, um, the sometimes difficult tale of Ann Lister and Eliza Rain, and let me just say that there are very few of us on the face of the earth that um, can say that we haven't been unkind to somebody at some point in our lives. So uh, sad but true, and here we are. Uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in to this. And um, I hope that you'll uh, check out our YouTube station, Ann Lister Birthday Week. Uh, where we have several other interviews, uh, all very interesting, and we have more coming uh, in the next couple of months. We have three more that are lined up right now and several more that are lined up for the spring of 2021, so stay with us. Uh, I want to thank, as always, I want to thank my team that's back behind this screen right now, Livia Labate, um, Steph Galloway, and we have a new member, uh, Catherine Martin. I'm sorry I, if I got that wrong. She just joined us today. And uh, again, I'm Pat Eskate. I thank you for uh, sitting in with us today. I want you all to stay as safe as you possibly can out there. We're moving back into an uptick of the infection. I want you to stay as safe as you can. So please remember, wear a mask. See you next time. <laughs>